Welcome back to Atlanta. Just moments away from kickoff, Georgia Tech will get it first as they take on Wake Forest. Paul Johnson now in his second season in charge of the Ramblin' Wreck, brought his spread option to Atlanta from Navy, and it has been very potent, Art, the reigning ACC Coach of the Year. On the other sideline, Jim Grove now in his ninth year, just three years removed from an ACC championship in the smallest school in bowl subdivision. Remarkably, only about 4,500 students go to Wake Forest. It's like a big high school. Yeah. And not to mention their tough academic standards as well. So he really has uh, done a terrific job there. We couldn't ask for a better day to play football. Oh, perfect. Temperatures in the 60s here. The students all fired up trying to cheer Georgia Tech on to its seventh straight victory. They are off to their best start since 1990 when they won the national championship. Klein Beam getting ready to kick it off. Orwin Smith, Embry Peebles back for Georgia Tech. Wake won the toss and deferred, so Tech gets it first. Squid kick picked up around the 10 by Peebles, and he is taken down right at the 20-yard line. That is where Georgia Tech starts. Lee Malko, a backup defensive end, made the stop after an 11-yard return. Josh Nebit, Nesbitt, a junior out of Greensboro, Georgia, was more of a classic dropback or shotgun passer in high school, has a good arm, but mostly hands off in this offense. Well, he does a great job of reading the triple option. And then also, he's a big threat when he carries the football, Pam. You look at the rush yards and the pass yards and the touchdowns for his career. And there is a Wake Forest player down on the field after that kickoff. It looks like Malkow, the, uh, the man who made the tackle. That is Lee Malko, a junior from Augusta, Georgia, being looked at after the opening kickoff. Take a look at the end of it and see exactly what happened. And there's Peebles with the ball, and you see he got hit, and it's hard to really see what happened to Malco. So as they continue to look at Malco, we will take a quick break. When we come back, Georgia Tech and its exciting offense. Welcome back to Atlanta. We have yet to run an offensive play. Lee Malco, who made the tackle on the opening kickoff, they're putting an air cast now on uh, his lower leg. It didn't look like much from our first replay, but they're uh, looking at uh, what could very possibly be a broken bone in his, in his lower leg. So they're working now to get him off the field. We have more college football coming your way on ABC tonight. Most of the nation will see Brian Kelly's Cincinnati Bearcats take on the UConn Huskies. After landing in the top five of the BCS standings, can the unbeaten Bearcats continue their great run? Other parts of the nation get Oklahoma, Nebraska, or USC, Arizona State. Check your local listings. Saturday Night Football presented by Southwest Airlines on ABC at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific time. Randy Etzel doing a terrific job keeping that UConn team together after the tragic murder of one of his players Jasper Howard and and we don't we don't like to be to have conjecture on an injury but we saw a replay and uh, with the air cast you got to figure that Malco could very well be dealing with a broken bone yeah there's no doubt in my mind and you know I haven't gone to medical school yet but I know it when <laughs> I see it and that was that was a nasty look and I don't even want to see it again but we're gonna get him taken care of but going back to that matchup tonight Cincinnati Brian Kelly and his Bearcat football team undefeated Penn. They have not fumbled the ball, have not lost a fumble Astonishing. all year. How amazing is that? Good fans here in Atlanta giving the Augusta Georgia native Lee Malco an ovation as he is carted off the field. And this Wake Forest team already not among the deepest teams, to say the least, in the ACC are now down a backup defensive end who is also a special teams player. So here comes Georgia Tech. Josh Nesbitt running this offense. Only Nevada is more potent on the ground, but you always have to be aware of them putting the ball up. Single coverage on wide receivers because of the option offense, and they will take deep shots. Ray comes out in a 5-2 look. Normally a 4-3 defense. And the first play of the game, Nesbitt pitches it out. 
And here's Dwyer, had a monstrous game last week against Vanderbilt, a career high in rushing. He's off to a terrific start with a 21-yard gain. Impact, impact players, Anthony Allen, one of the running backs that you will see, the transfer from Louisville, who's been very good. Yeah, and then Dwyer, who just got the ball there, really turning his game up a notch. And then the guy who made that last play go, Demarius Thomas, they call him Bebe, and Bebe threw a big block on that last one to clear the perimeter for Dwyer. Averaging over 24 yards per catch. Lions now the running back. Into the game for Tech, Matt Woodleaf making the stop on Lions, who is a transfer from Colgate, never played there, and then came into Georgia Tech. He's in for one play, and Dwyer, number 21, scoots back in. And that's what Georgia Tech does. They roll in those backs to bring the plays in, as Paul Johnson will just give the play to a player and send it in. Not like you, you saw, you know, over the years back high school and a lot of, a lot of younger football they, they do it that way and that's how Paul likes to do it. Johnson is his own offensive coordinator and right up the gut it's Dwyer again running for first down nine more yards for Jonathan so 30 yards on two carries. Yeah, and a great cutoff block watch the center right here take care of the nose gonna cut him off just lay on the ground basically Sean Bedford the center clearing up that inside angle on the dive play and that's Jonathan Dwyer trying to run people over and early in the year he was trying to make people miss and a couple of his teammates got to him said dude just do what you do run him over and that has worked to saw the ball come out but it was late Nesbitt nothing doing loses a yard on that carry John Russell who was a high school teammate of his starting quarterback Riley Skinner made the stop so Georgia Tech really has been rolling in their last five games, they've won six in a row, but particularly in the last five, they've been an offensive juggernaut. Oh, uh, yeah. You're scoring almost 42 points a game, ripping up close to 500 yards. That's getting it done, and it makes it hard for the other team. you got to keep up with them, but you can't get the football because they possess it for so long. Last week against Vanderbilt, 597 yards. Nesbitt decides to take it on his own. Gets about four yards, three or four yards upfield. Kyle Quarles and John Bush make the stop for Wake Forest. So the Wake Forest defense, what do they have to be looking at right now to try to defend and stop this spread option? Well, Brad Lambert, their defensive coordinator, said that what they want to do is hit the quarterback. They want to get and make it tough for Josh Nesbitt, and they also want to pressure him at the mesh point. That means attacking and trying to get penetration into the A-gaps to really create problems with that long ride on the mesh in this option game. Forcing him into a third and eight. Nesbitt's pass is complete. There's the star, Demarius Thomas. Catches it for a first down. Brandon G is going to have the assignment of trying to cover him one-on-one -on -one today. And that is tough duty. Watch the hands of Thomas. You see how he reaches out and catches it with the hands. He's got the thumbs together. This is just a, a great athlete reaching back, finding the football, and then catching it with his hands. He doesn't let it get into his body. And when you catch it that way, more often than not, you're, you're going to have a successful play. Tech has completed 51 passes on the year, 35 of them to Thomas. Dwyer gets the carry, picks up a couple more. So you're talking about Demarius Thomas, or Bebe, as he is uh, known to his family and friends. 68% of all the completions go to number eight. Yeah, and they go for about 25 yards. You see the, the way it breaks down, and he is the main target for Josh Nesbitt. And, you know, when he first, when Paul Johnson came here, Thomas considered transferring. And, they, you know, they said, you know what, give it a shot. See what happens. Brian Bohannon, the quarterback's coach, spoke with him and decided to stick around. He actually caught more balls in this offense than Chan Gailey's old one. Nesbitt throwing towards Thomas in the end zone. Anthony Allen also was back there, but it falls incomplete. And here's another third and eight. Nesbitt thought he missed him. And yeah, Nesbitt did miss him because look at Thomas. He just runs past everybody. And Nesbitt is late with the throw, and then he throws it outside. It was really more towards Allen than it was the open man, Thomas. And you see Nesbitt saying, yeah, that's on me. He knows he missed one there. Coming into this game, eight of Nesbitt's 48 completions were for 50 yards or more. Here's a, their second, third, and eight on this drive. He gets hit, does Nesbitt as he delivered the ball. It's off the hands of Embry Peoples. 
John Russell hit Nesbitt just as he delivered the football. Nesbitt shows me something here, making a throw, running to his left, puts it right on the money. And he takes a little shot after he delivers the ball, but hangs in there and throws the perfect strike. But Peoples was not able to make a catch. That was right there, right in the basket. And the drop by Peoples brings in Scott Blair to attempt a 45-yard field goal. And the longest attempt that he's had this year, Pam, has been 42. So this is on the outer edge of his range. They have not had to call on him much because they score so many touchdowns, and he comes through. Scott Blair knocking home a now career-long 45-yard field goal. Tech is up early. My top pick this season in Atlanta, where Georgia Tech has scored on its opening drive of the football game. Paul Johnson's team, however, having to settle for a new career-long 45-yard field goal by Scott Blair. Held on the ball for four minutes and eight seconds. Nobody in the country holds on the ball longer than Georgia Tech, averaging 35 minutes plus per game with the football. Really missed two opportunities in the passing game to make that a touchdown drive. Short kickoff, taken around the 13 by Lavelle Jackson, and he finds his seam. Tackled down around the 37-yard line. That's a nice 24-yard return for him. Anthony Barnes making the stop, a backup linebacker for Georgia Tech. So here comes Riley Skinner. He did not practice at all on Monday, gradually worked his way back after the concussion. Really scary looking hit. Helmet flew off, face mask was broken, and uh, he said it's the first time he's ever had to leave a game. Yeah, and it was a bad time to leave the game. They were uh, trying to drive down to go back ahead of Miami after really controlling that game. First time he had to leave the game anyway after getting hit in the head. Josh Adams, their tailback, very talented as a pass receiver, is just buried by Morgan Burnett. Cedric Griffin is the guy who really makes this play initially. Go ahead and let that run as Griffin is outside to the left. Watch him come in right there and force the lateral running from Adams, and that allowed Morgan Bur Burnett to come up and make the play. Adams only averaging about 48 yards per game on the ground, but Wake is one of those teams that uses a lot of short passes, sort of a de facto running game. They only picked up a yard on that play. This time Adams carries it. And he is tackled down the yard upfield by Brad Jefferson, the leading tackler for Georgia Tech. Impact players now on this side of the ball. We already talked to you about Adams, very talented as both a receiver and a rusher for the Demon Deacons. And Devin Brown had a big game last week, 12 catches, but he also fumbled a punt, which really hurt him. And then Marshall Williams, their leading receiver, number eight for the other side. We got two pretty good number eight in terms of receivers here, and Demarius Thomas and Marshall Williams. Williams, their leading returning receiver from last year, third and six, and it's gotten loud here. Skinner steps up and fires on the sideline where it is incomplete. Mario Edwards making his first career start today for Georgia Tech. There you see him, number 33, got in the way of the pass intended for Lavelle Jackson. And the pressure is what forced the timing on this last play to become skewed, and that's why Skinner was just late. That thing was almost picked off because he was late with the timing on that corner route as Edwards comes up with a play. And Wake Forest has struggled with its protection of Skinner. They have allowed 22 sacks on the season. Shane Popham in for his first punt. Tarrant back for it. Fair catch right at the 15-yard line. Gerard with the fair catch. Well, let's take a look at this triple option offense, Pam. You start, it all starts with the dive man, the fullback. You get him the ball, things are going to go well. Then the quarterback has to be able to make good reads on the perimeter. If somebody's forcing into him, he's got a pitch. If not, he can take the ball, and Nesbitt is very good at that. And then the third and final option is the wing back, the pitch man on the perimeter. And you see the nice ball handling by Josh Nesbitt to get that ball out there to Anthony Allen on that big play. And those, that's the triple option, dive, keep, and pitch. As you see, only Nevada averages more yards per ground or per game on the ground. Nesbitt pitches it to Allen. 
And Allen has plenty of room up the right sideline. Josh Bush pushes him out after a 19-yard gain. Let's go to Matt Weiner in our Times Square studio. Thank you, guys. I'll be with you all afternoon long to keep you on top of the biggest stories of the day, starting with this Taco Bell update. A homecoming for Ohio State quarterback Terrell Pryor, the Pennsylvania native. And the Buckeyes taking on Penn State. A good start for Pryor. Seven-yard touchdown run there. Ohio State has the jump on the lines in Happy Valley. 7-0 early. Thank you, Matt. An upset earlier today in the Big Ten. Iowa finally has lost a football game. I guess you can only play with fire so long. They lost to Northwest. Nesbitt going up top to Thomas, and he can't get him. Thomas got behind two defenders, beating Quarles out there. And they couldn't connect. And here you see it's a, a veer pass, Pam. They faked the option, the dive part of it, and the corners are peeking in there. Both G and Quarles peeking in there. And when they do that, Thomas is going to get a step on you. And that's the third deep shot of the day so far for the Tech offense. They've been open every time. They had one drop pass and two overthrows. And Thomas heads out, takes a breather on second and ten. Nesbitt will stutter step and then breaks a tackle. Josh Nesbitt falling forward close to the 40-yard line, picked up five. Michael Lockett made the stop for the Demon Deacons. Yeah, and it was Jello Orange getting the penetration that really kind of blew that thing up. Jello Orange, one of the great names, that's his given name, number 57 for Wake Forest is Haitian. Came to the United States before his junior year of high school, so he's not played a lot of football, but I love that name. Yeah, they can't top that one. <laughs> and he made a good play to boot for a kid who's not been playing football that long. Third and five. And Dwyer with the football picks up another first down. Hunter Haynes made the stop. And this is the slide draw, Pam. It's one of the favorite plays. You're going to see a little step to the side, and then that's the angle that uh, Jonathan Dwyer will take. And it just sets up the whole defense thinking past the slide protection look from the line, the hesitation, and then the cut back against the grain. It's a very good football play. Sets up another first down. And then a couple of yards on that play. Dwyer tackled down by... John Russell, the senior from Jacksonville, one of the one of the leaders on this defense, and we had a chance to to have a phone conversation with John the other day. Very uh, a very impressive young man, great student athlete for Wake Forest. Yeah, his dad coaches high school football, coached him, and said there was very a lot of discipline, no nonsense, and it's a, it really developed great character through that. His dad, Dick Russell, coached him as a freshman and a sophomore. Made a good play, second and eight. Nesbitt with the pitch. And Dwyer, who's in a whole mess of trouble, loses yardage. G forced him out, but there was some good penetration by that Wake defense. Forced out of bounds by number 17, Brandon G. Yeah, that watch the linebacker right here. He's going to come off the edge and get, he's got quarterback responsibility. And that's Hunter Hayes just doing an excellent job of knowing what he has. Haynes, excuse me, and then sticking with your responsibility. You have to play assignment football against the option. Second game back for Hunter. He's been out for an injury for a few games. Nesbitt on the wall decides to take off. Number nine, Josh Nesbitt. Haynes again on the stop. Penalty flags coming down late. Yeah, you got a late hit there. Looks like number five, Kyle Quarles. Personal foul. Number five on the defense. 15 yards and one run. Automatic first down. And he just walloped somebody after the play. Kind of a continuing action type thing. But you got to stop when the whistle blows. And see him right there, he just finishes off Quentin Sims. And you just got to stop. And that is particularly bad of Quarles because it would have been a fourth and three for Georgia Tech. They did not pick up the first down, do so with the penalty. Now first and 10 from the 31. Nesbitt with the pitch to Lyons, and Lyons! Norbert is gonna catch him! On 
touched into the end zone for the Georgia Tech touchdown. Touchdown run for Georgia Tech takes it in from 31 yards out. All right, he didn't have to do a whole lot but just run because he got some excellent blocking and then a perfect timing on the pitch from Josh Nesbitt. Scott Blair makes it 10 nothing Georgia Tech two for two on their possession. Their two possessions. Lucas Cox throws the big block on Anthony Allen to clear the way and Georgia Tech up 10. Paul Johnson, the head coach and acts as his own offensive coordinator. Talking to the folks upstairs, his team up 10 nothing. Georgia Tech already with 108 rushing yards. And what amazes me, Paul Johnson did not use a call sheet to call his offense. It's all up in his head. He's been running it for a long time and running it well. Lavelle Jackson gets the kickoff, runs into one of his own guys, and is tackled down at the 17-yard line, a 12-yard return for him. Let's go back to the touchdown, right? Yeah, a couple things to look at. Here is Joey Ehrman, and then right there is Lucas Cox. Cox is going to motion back and then come and lead, and then Ehrman is the guy they're going to option. And you see the option, Nesbitt, Ehrman takes quarterback, so he pitches it out. Cox gets the great block, and that allows the touchdown from Preston Lions. Lions' first career touchdown by far, his farthest run of the year as well, his previous long of at 13. That busted open for 31. Wake Forest and Riley Skinner back on the field. Adams. Check that, it's Brandon Pendergrass had to reverse field and he got absolutely nothing. Pendergrass more of a power runner than Adams and uh, you think as a pure runner may be a, a little bit better than Adams. Yeah, I think he uh, has a little more upside as far as power at just five foot nine, 200 pounder. But they're both very similar and Adams is the better receiver. That's his strength because he, he'll come out of the backfield and make plays. but. I think Pendergrass is a good one. Just a sophomore out of Florida. No gain, however, so it's second and ten. Linebacker showing blitz, but then backs off. Skinner dumps it out to Pendergrass. Mario Butler gets him after a, only a two-yard gain, so here comes a third and eight for the Demon Deacons. The defensive coordinator for Georgia Tech, Dave Womack, has really pared down this his call sheet. A lot of injuries and things. He had to really pare it down and just do base stuff to get this group going. And they struggled a couple of weeks, picked it up a little bit in the second half last week against Vanderbilt, held them without any points. And they're looking pretty good so far here today. The defense that gave up 400 yards in the first half against Florida State, a game they've won. Skinner on third and eight. Steps up, taking a long shot, and it is knocked down. Here's a flag. Jefferson, a linebacker on Chris Gibbons, the wide receiver. And this is a mismatch as Jefferson's trying to cover Gibbons. Pass and defense, number 51, 15 yards, previous spot, automatic step down. You see right at the end, Jefferson gets a little push on him. But here's the deal. You've got a couple of safeties deep, and that means that this middle linebacker right here, excuse me, has to cover the deep middle of the field. You hear about that Tampa 2 all the time and those things. What that means is those two safeties are going to favor towards the outside, and anything that threatens the deep middle, the middle linebacker has to carry, and you get mismatches on that deal. Good play call. Good job by Riley Skinner going after that weakness. Ball, though, was underthrown but it induced the interference call. Devon Brown with the catch. Good play by Butler to knock him out of bounds for a two-yard loss. Mario Butler, one of the very good students on this team, a science, technology, and culture major. That sounds hard. <laughs> Everything here is hard, I think, at Georgia Tech. Yeah, you just, you just don't get into Georgia Tech. No. You, you've got to have something going for you. Our spotter, Bill Garrity, was a proud Georgia Tech guy. 
Yeah, there are exceptions. Yes. <laughs> Second and 12 now. Skinner fakes the end around, gives it to Pendergrass. And he just gets back to the original line of scrimmage, picked up a couple. Steven Sylvester making a stop for this Georgia Tech defense. I thought T.J. Barnes, big number 90 on the defensive line, did a heck of a job of, of staying with his deal and closing the thing off. And Barnes, six foot seven, 341 pounder. He can clock some things up in the middle. And he's only a redshirt freshman. He's a baby that big. Third and 10. their leading receiver somehow had all sorts of room on the right side picked up 37 big ones yeah williams comes from the opposite side and he's just going to kind of sneak through the middle you see here he is he's just run a little underneath dig route linebacker never saw him that's jefferson and he snuck behind him and skinner with his ability to move in the pocket bought the time for that thing to come open and then had nice touch on the pass to, to get it over that second level First catch for Williams, Steve Robotsky, the offensive coordinator for Wake Forest in his ninth year, coinciding with head coach Jim Grove. Back to Pendergrass. Didn't find anything up the middle, so he broke outside. Morgan Burnett got the stop, but it's a three-yard gain. Well, let's go back to Matt Weiner in our Times Square studio. All right, Pam, let's get a Verizon Wireless update on Oregon. Fresh in their domination of USC, but down 10 nothing at Stanford when LaMichael James goes to work, averaging 140 yards per game since replacing LeGarrette Blunt. 60-yard touchdown run there makes it 10-7. LSU and Alabama with the SEC West up for grabs. Still scoreless in the first. Thank you very much, Matt. And here we have a 10-0 Georgia Tech lead. Wake Forest driving the ball now on that second and seven. Skinner completes it to Mike Renfret, their fullback. They like to throw to their fullbacks, and that one's good for a first down. And they'll, they put Renfret out there in the slot. And he's out there on the left side in the slot. You can't quite see him in this picture, but just runs a quick out pass. And Skinner does such a great job of, of seeing what the defense is going to give him pre-snap and then developing that through the snap and then getting rid of the football right away so that his receivers still have a little separation. I think Ryan Skinner is a very good quarterback, and head coach Jim Grove agrees. Does a really good job of spreading the ball around as well this time. He flicks it out to Devon Brown, and Brown is about a yard short of the first down. Cedric Griffin credit him with the tackle, but this is a nice drive that Wake Forest has put together, helped by a pass interference penalty. They've already gone 73 yards. And to follow up on that, and speaking to Jim Grove, you know, he used to be an option guy and, and until he got Riley Skinner. And then, he, you know, he said he's the, he's the best. I don't know how we could get a better one. And because of that, he's really changed the offense and just taking advantage of the skills and strengths of Skinner. Second and one in the red zone. At the six. Pendergrass going around the left side. Pursued and taken down, picked up the first down, but Burnett had a beat on him and tackled him after a two-yard gain. And this play is designed to go up the middle. You see the center pulling. That's Russell Ninon, and they wanted to go right behind him, but there's nothing there. And the, the skills of Pendergrass it enables him to get a couple of yards just by bouncing that thing out and using his speed on the perimeter. And that sets up a first and goal from the four-yard line. Tenth play of the drive coming up, started way back on Wake's 18. Two fullbacks in now. Pitch to Pendergrass. 
and he's taken down for a loss. Terrific pursuit. Derek Morgan, the best defensive lineman for the Yellow Jackson Jackets, proved it on that play. Well, they couldn't hook him. They block him with two guys. Look, Ren Brett tries to get him along with Joe Birdsong. That's what you call keeping contained, keeping the outside arm free, not letting it get outside of you, and then making a football play at the end. Great play by Morgan as the first quarter comes to a close. We are back on the campus of Georgia Tech. Wake Forest with this drive has now taken over the time of possession lead. Wake second to Georgia Tech in time of possession in the ACC. And they're looking at a second and goal from the five, trying to put a bite into this 10-0 Tech lead. Kevin Harris now the running back next to Skinner. Harris is fake too, and then Skinner throws it into the ground, whether rather than throw it to Devon Brown, who would have been stopped for a loss by Steven Sylvester. Well, Sylvester with the pressure on Skinner forcing that. Yeah, and you're gonna see here's the pressure coming right here off the edge. And there's nobody to block the edge man. And that's Sylvester bringing the heat. And they wanted to drop it off to Devin Brown, who was going behind the line of scrimmage in that little motion. Nice design on the play, but they didn't anticipate the pressure off the edge. Here's third and goal. Harris still back there next to Skinner. Pressure, and he dumps it down to Harris, who stops short. Cedric Griffin, the linebacker, stopping him about a yard short of the end zone. This is a favorite play of Wake Forest running that screen down in this area. And Griffin, he saw the same tapes that I saw, and he is going to hang in there. I believe this is the big guy right here. Watch him. He's just sitting in there, reading it, seeing it. And then he comes from the inside to help as well as Griffin from the outside. That was Jefferson and Griffin. The linebackers collapsing to take that screen away, and that's what they're supposed to do. So they're stopped on the two. So here comes Jimmy Newman, a true freshman, in to try a 19-yard field goal. And Wake gets on the board but has to settle for three. There is a flag down. And they're going to get a running into the kicker there. Like Morgan Burnett. And that might just be the uh, roughing the kicker, which would give Wake Forest a first down. And that's what it is. Close the foul. Roughing the kicker on the defense. Half the distance. Automatic. First down. All right. Big break for the Demon Deacons. And you see right at the end there. And yeah, that's a pretty good solid hit. Morgan Burnett, whether he was blocked into it or not, you cannot get a hit like that on the kicker. They protect him. It's a defenseless player. And uh, Jimmy Newman didn't even have to do an acting job on that one. He got whacked pretty good. So two key penalties on this drive, a pass interference, and now we're roughing the kicker. It sets up first and goal from the one. Take the three points off the board. They're going for a touchdown. And a timeout taken by Georgia Tech. Yeah, they didn't have anyone covering the man in the slot. Right here, you see nobody at all is on Devin Brown. And the defense is starting to freak out. You see the corner all down there saying, hey, we need help. Mario Butler saying, come on, timeout, timeout. We don't have this thing covered. So they do take the timeout. There's, you know, there's only three races remaining in the chase for the cup. Jimmy Johnson holds a commanding lead in his quest for an unprecedented four straight championship. The Dickies 500 at Texas comes your way tomorrow Sunday at 2.30 Eastern on ABC. Coverage begins with NASCAR Countdown. So Jimmy Johnson has just dominated the sport. And our favorite old guy, Mark Martin, we say that with all the affection in the world, is uh, fading here. Johnson has really come on strong. Three races left. Check it out tomorrow on ABC. The pitch back to Harris, and he gets into the end zone. The roughing the kicker penalty. Curtin, Georgia Tech, Wake Forest with the touchdown.
This is that toss play that they tried to run earlier. It wasn't open to the outside the last time. It wasn't open on the outside this time, but Harris sees the seam and cuts it up inside the tackle on a toss, and he's able to find the end zone. Harris had missed the last six games, bothered by a groin injury has come back and scored the touchdown. Now we get word that they are going to review the previous play. Yeah, they're just going to see if the knee was down prior to him going in the end zone. Knees down, but I got to believe this is the, the line right here. And you need indisputable video evidence to overturn it. And you cannot see the ball from that angle. So I don't see how they can overturn this thing, even though that knee was down. You can't see where the ball is, so you can't overturn it. That's a touchdown. Yeah, and Ted Jackson is our replay official today and like that, that view you can't tell anything so this thing is going to stand Ted's been at 29 years on the field he knows what he's doing you see it stands he didn't confirm it because he couldn't with those looks so the play just stands Gary Patterson our referee giving us the word so Kevin Harris, a senior from Sanford, Florida, who started early in the season and now has battled his way back after a six-game absence, gets into the end zone. Jimmy Newman, who hit a 19-yard field goal, taken off the board because of the roughing penalty, adds the extra point. A very impressive drive by Riley Skinner and company. It's a 10-7 game. Play by George Teague just to catch up with them, showing his speed to catch up with them, and then to make the strip save the touchdown. And he went on to a career with the Green Bay Packers. See, play number 14 revealed later on tonight at 8 Eastern Time on ABC. So Wake Forest helped by two big Georgia Tech penalties. Now only down three. That's a booming kick by Klein Beam. Orman Smith has to take it for the touchback. Let's take a look at our Pacific Life game summary so far. Georgia Tech got out to a 10 to nothing lead. You see the rush yard squarely in favor of Georgia Tech, but time of possession. Wake Forest had it for over six and a half minutes on that touchdown drive, so they're leading in that category. Yeah, and you look at the big 20 plus yard runs, three of them already for this Tech offense, and that's because they're getting the ball out to the perimeter to the pitch man. That's where you usually get your big plays in this offense when that triple option goes all the way to that third option to the pitch. And there's the man who runs the show, Josh Nesbitt. This time he decides to hang on to it himself. There's a flag down at the line of scrimmage near John Russell. Kyle Quarles made the stop after a 12-yard gain, but we have to check the flag. Yeah, and it's probably going to be a chop block, which you see once in a while, and that's a big, a big bone of contention for a lot of coaches in this Atlantic Coast chop Conference. Block. Number 70 on the offense. Half the distance. Watch Gilbert, the, the tackle. What, what's going to happen is you're going to high low two guys. It actually was the center, Gilbert and Bedford, the, excuse me, Gilbert the guard, Bedford the center, and they high low the man on the nose. And which you, you just can't do that. You can't post a guy high and then have another guy chop him. And that's, that's an illegal thing, and that's something that a lot of the coaches have been upset about. In fact, even Paul Johnson, went to the ACC officials meeting this past fall and talked to him about that kind of thing. And Dwyer gets it on first and 20 and butts it out for a huge 31-yard gain. Dwyer showing his prowess once again on the pitch. Watch how quickly he is forced to pitch as Ermitt's coming off the edge. And that's the thing at being the quarterback, Nesbitt, you've got to be ready to pitch immediately. And as soon as he got the man in his face, Ermitt, he flips it out there. Dwyer's ready. Good block out there on the edge by Tyler Melton to make that thing go. And that is the fourth run on a pitch that went for at least 20 yards in this game. Nesbitt in trouble and goes down. Tried to get away from the pressure, but Jello Orange got him. That's a nine yard loss on the sack for Orange. 57, Orange. Orange just kept his rush lane. That was the key. 
Stayed outside, and when Nesbitt tried to escape, he's going to run right into it. I'm working on Phil Smith, who's getting his start today because Austin Barrick is injured. In fact, Barrick out for the rest of the year, so Smith is going to see a lot of work. Barrick out with a bad ankle. Orange now credited with three and a half sacks on the season. Nesbitt doesn't go anywhere. It's Orange again. It's Jello time. <laughs> Jello stops him after a one yard game. Great hustle. Here's Jello Orange and just watch him continue to run down the line. Actually, he's the next man over on the left. Watch him see him just follow, chase down the line. Very seldom can you catch an option team from behind. But Jello Orange takes a great angle of pursuit. And you see Nesbitt had to kind of move in and out a little bit because of good defense on the front side. Dominique Majet making the play to slow him down. Orange, a converted linebacker, showing that speed to chase down Nesbitt. Third and 19. Here's a flag down at the line of scrimmage. Thomas, who was being defended by G, couldn't get the pass. Joseph Gilbert holding. Got caught on an inside move and had the grab. Number 71 on the outfield. The penalties are due. Fourth out. Well, this Georgia Tech offense getting off to the Big Ten nothing start has stalled the last couple of times, and they're forced to punt. And I want to apologize to Mr. Gilbert. It was Court Howard who got caught holding. You know, offensive linemen, they, they only get their name called usually when it's a penalty, and you'd hate to call it on a guy that really didn't do it. So, excuse me, Mr. Gilbert. Chandler Anderson gets the low snap, punts it away. Devon Brown says, stay away from it. He does, and it is collected at the 30-yard line. 37-yard punt. Wake Forest back in this game has the ball, and we come back to Atlanta. Georgia Tech and Wake Forest playing for the first time since the 2006 ACC Championship game that Wake won with a young Riley Skinner at quarterback. And now he's a senior, connects with Marshall Williams upfield for about a five-yard gain. Riley Skinner, a terrific story, rewriting all the Wake Forest record books, and incredible considering that he was barely recruited. He told us that only Wake Forest was the only Division I school that offered him, and this is just some of the school records he has. At Wake. Yeah, he said he got looked at because of John Russell, a high school teammate of him, his, who also went to Wake Forest. They said they were over there watching him, and they... Who's this quarterback? He ain't too bad either. And I'm really close to signing day. They found a scholarship for him. And it is, to say the least, worked out for both Skinner and Wake Forest. Another completion, this time to Devon Brown for the first down. Cedric Griffin gets the stop, but it's an eight-yard game. And this Wake Forest passing game is a lot of quick stuff. You don't see Riley Skinner throwing the ball down the field very much. Just twice so far today has he thrown the ball longer than 10 yards. A lot of these things are behind the line of scrimmage or from zero to five or from six to 10. And he gets a lot of nice little matchups in that deal with wide receivers on linebackers. Riley says this off offense, which really uh, went through some changes since last season, very comfortable in the way that they are running that they are running the offense now, which has become primarily a passing offense. Skinner with a little pump fake completes it out to Josh Adams into Georgia Tech territory. Skinner's passing play number 20. There's a flag on the field back near Skinner. Might have got whacked in the head late. Remember, he's coming back from that concussion last week. Roughing the passer. Defense. Hands to the face. 15 yards from near the run. First down. Yeah, he got swatted right across the brow as he let the thing go. You see, here he is making the pump. And right there, whack. That's big number 90, T.J. Barnes. And when a six foot seven, 341 guy, pound guy, whacks you in the head, you're gonna feel it. And especially with the concussion that he's coming off of from last week, obviously gonna protect the quarterback regardless. Well, that's three big penalties against Georgia Tech in this game. Adams, 
danced around and found a nice hole down inside the 30-yard line. Back to the Times Square studio and Matt Weiner for an update. All right, Pam, the Sports Center right now is presented by Sprint. You know about number four, Iowa's lost today. Now number three, Alabama trails to LSU. Jordan Jefferson hit D'Angelo Peterson for a 7-0 lead there. Poised to move up is number six, TCU. The Horn Frogs are on the road and leading 14-0 against San Diego State. Alabama being down to LSU early. Alabama has not beaten LSU at home in 10 years. A tough place to go. Second and five. Skinner throws it up towards Devon Brown. The good defense back there by Jared Tarrant. Tarrant does an excellent job of turning and looking for the ball at the end. He's beat initially. Look at that. Brown's got a step or two on him, but Tarrant turns back to look for the ball rather than go after the defender. And that's a, a well-coached football player right there. Gerard Tarrant, just a sophomore, did not play a whole lot last week because of a bad back. Has been in there and playing well. Here's a third and five. Skinner zips it out, completes it to Gibbons for the first down. Gibbons beating Mario Butler to the spot, picks up six, moves the chains. And right pre-snap, Riley Skinner sees the cushion that he has out there. So he's able to get it to Gibbons right away in front of Mario Butler, or Butler before he can react and come back up on. And that's just a senior quarterback recognizing pre-snap where he wants to go and then getting the ball out of his hands quickly and accurately. First down at the 23. Now Brown on the run play. Picks up two or three, stopped by Derek Morgan from the other side. This is what I was talking about earlier, Pam, as far as where Riley Skinner's passes are going. Look at this, four of five behind the line of scrimmage, six of six from zero to five yards. And that, that's just that quick passing game where he gets the ball out accurately, shorter throws, and he gets it to the receivers before the defense can come in, and it's been productive for him. Able to pick apart defenses so comfortable in this offense, a four-year starter. In fact, making his 33rd straight start this afternoon. We have an injured Demon Deacon on the field at his tight end, Cameron Ford, who started the last three games now for Andrew Parker, who has been out with a hurt ankle. And now his backup, Cameron Ford, is hurt. We'll take a quick break and then come back to Georgia Tech. This January on ABC. Welcome back. Cameron Ford has been helped off the field, favoring his left leg. Here's his second and eight for Wake Forest. Skinner wide open. Devon Brown untouched into the end zone. And Wake Forest, once down 10 0, takes its first lead. Skinner so effective feeling his way in the pocket to buy extra time allowing Devon Brown to make his way into the end zone work matched up on a linebacker again and when you get those matchups boy that's good for an offense 19th touchdown pass of the season for Skinner Newman makes it 14 10 Wake Forest here he is in the slot. You're going to see him just do a little hesitation move, hook up, and then go. And Brad Jefferson doesn't have a chance as he bites on this thing. See him react over to the side, and then the safety help over the top was wide out to the outside where the other two receivers were. There's nobody left in the middle. It doesn't get any easier than that. And Devon Brown making his presence felt on a nice pass, a nice read, and good work in the pocket from Riley Skinner. Devon's third touchdown catch of the season, a sophomore from outside of Washington, D.C., and Ashburn, Virginia. Boy, this Wake Forest offense on its first drive had a three and out and was one penalty away from a three and out on its second drive, but they have really turned it on, helped by a couple of penalties, but they're definitely executing that. Uh, they would have had consecutive three and outs to start the game except for that long uh, pass interference penalty. 
So a roughing the kicker penalty took three points off the board and Wake Forest scored a touchdown, so they have scored touchdowns on two of their three possessions. Owen Smith with the kickoff. Busts up the middle, taken down at the 36-yard line. It's a 29-yard return for the true freshman. Let's take a look at today's Aflac trivia question. There's, There's, a duck. Our, there's our buddy, the Duck. Ron Dane, who was a Badger, won the 1999 Heisman Trophy. Our question is, who finished second to Dane? Yeah, I know. Of course you know. Because I was told in the production room, so. Not because of your cheap. inherent brilliance. Well, I guessed it, but it wasn't that hard to guess. <laughs> we'll have the answer coming up shortly. So let's see what Georgia Tech can do. Not much. Boy, Nesbitt decided not to pitch it and lost yardage. Kyle Wilbur, who is back after a broken fibula against Stanford playing today and was in on this tackle. He should have pitched this. You're going to end up, watch this, with three guys on the quarterback. Let this thing roll a little bit. All right, freeze it right there. You got one, two, three guys working on the quarterback. There's nobody out on the pitch guy. And they have a lead blocker going. Nesbitt really should have pitched that one. It would have been a huge play. So Roddy Jones was all by his lonesome. Now they're going to pitch it the other way. Stephen Hill coming around. He's got the first down and a whole lot more. Flag comes in. Hill going down the sideline. Scores the touchdown for Georgia Tech. What a crazy play. It's coming back. They're going to get Bebe, Demarius Thomas, on a hold. That's going to wipe out a 66-yard touchdown. It was fun to watch, though. <laughs> Hold him. Number eight on the offense. 10 yards from the spot of the foul. So another penalty for Georgia Tech. It's coming in your view right there. You see it. Marius Thomas just grabs right a hold of Brandon G. And usually this Georgia Tech team does not commit a lot of penalties, and they've had quite a few in this game already. In fact, that is their fifth, and really four of them have been backbreakers almost. Matt Killers. As you mentioned previously, Pam, the roughing the kicker. Allowed Wake Forest to continue a drive and get a touchdown rather than a field goal. And this one takes away a touchdown. That's an 11-point swing on, on those two penalties alone. Already over, almost 12 yards over their game average for penalties. And they have been big ones that have made a huge impact on this football game. Second and one, Dwyer, the running back, gets it and gets the first down. Right up the gut Number 21, for eight Dwyer. yards. So if you're Georgia Tech now, do you start to get a little demoralized with these penalties? Do you get ticked Not off? Not at all. They're, they're just too explosive, yep. in particular on offense. I think the defense has to clean up their act a little bit. But this offense is so explosive that one little penalty, you know what, they'll come back and keep, keep running and ripping. So I don't think Paul Johnson is affected by it too much in terms of his feeling in terms of the offense. Now, defensively, they got to clean that up. Offense just keeps coming at you. Another first down. The pitch to Roddy Jones. Jones picks up about three. Kyle Wilbur again making a stop. And the crowd wanted a penalty for a little toss him out of bounds at the end of that, but I think it was just continuing action. It's Kyle Wilbur getting back, coming back this week after being out from an injury. Broke his leg early in the year against Stanford. Second game of the season. That was a win for Wake Forest. Four and five on the season, but remember, four of those, four of those five losses were by a combined ten points. So there's a good play by John Russell, wrapping up Dwyer right away. And Russell's right here on the nose, and watch how he uses his hands to get off the center and then move laterally down the line. See him use the hands, get off the low block, and then just step right up into that A-gap and fill the hole. John Russell and White Forest faced a very similar offense playing at Navy in a driving rainstorm they lost by three a couple of weeks ago. 
So they have seen this offense, but not with this much talent in the skill position. I, I think that's a huge advantage for Wake Forest, having seen this offense already once this year, because that now nah, that's just a little recall in terms instead of having to totally turn the page in the book and learn totally new schemes and see an entirely different thing than what they've seen the other weeks of the season. Now it's something that's a little bit fresh in their mind, especially because it was a couple years ago. And here's Coach Johnson, notorious for going on fourth down. Yeah, you know he's going for it here. It's less than a yard. They are in Wake Forest territory. And they love to have Nesbitt keep the football. It looked like he bobbled the snap a little bit. Wow, this is a, an important spot coming up. Yeah, he dropped that snap. Otherwise, he'd have had it no problem. I think he might be short. Yeah, he is short. And that yellow line is electronically generated, not spot on, but very close. See, he dropped the ball initially, and that kept him from moving his legs. He just had to pick it up and lunge. Oh, and he did not get it. The crowd getting surlier and surlier. That they are. So not a clean exchange between Sean Bedford and Josh Nesbitt leads to turning the ball over on downs. Yeah, take a look at the football right in the middle there, and it just doesn't get cleanly into the hands. And Nesbitt, you see, he's got a knee on the ground as soon as he gets control of the ball. So it's a fair mark yeah, by the officials, a fair spot. Yeah, good spot, good job by this officiating crew. Wake Forest with the ball once again. Pendergrass. Close to a first down, picked up about nine on that run. Dominique Reese made the stop. This has been an astonishing turn of events. It looked like it would be all Georgia Tech today. Got out to that 10-0 lead, but they have not scored since. Wake has all 14 points here in the second quarter. And I'm not surprised in the least because this Wake Forest football team has been in every game but one this year, Pam. That was that loss to Clemson, 38-3 down at Death Valley. But they, they're a good football team, and that's what Coach Grove told us. You know, we're, we're, we're good enough to be in every game, and so far they have. Pendergrass with that nine-yard run, the longest run of the game so far for the Demon Deacons. Skinner faking it to Pendergrass. Fires it downfield. There's the fullback Renfred again, his second catch. And this one all the way down to the 36-yard line. Yeah, and Renfret actually lines up at tight end in this particular play. And they're trying to sneak the fullback in, but here he is, and he's just going to run this little route underneath as they fake it, a little bootleg action. And Skinner has time to throw it to the next level as the fullback, Bo Hannon, was covered up pretty good. Picked up 16 big yards. Wake Forest driving again. Georgia Tech showing blitz. Here they come. Skinner quickly got rid of it, but out of reach for Chris Gibbons. You can see Georgia Tech, they have those linebackers coming on the blitz. The way Wake Forest contends with the blitz is they'll have one side will be the blitz routes, the other side the concept or combination routes. And on that particular play, he only had one side of receivers, so he had to stick with it. Skinner gets rid of it just as he's hit, going again for Rinfret, but that's incomplete. This is incomplete. Good pressure by Derek Morgan again who has eight and a half of Tech's 14 sacks coming into this football game. Yeah, Derek Morgan is a one-man wrecking crew. All he does is just bull rush on this one. Watch him go working against Jeff, Jeff Griffin. He gets his hands inside, gets the leverage, and just uses those pads like a steering wheel. He put his foot on the gas pedal and slammed it home. Highly recruited, Ohio State, Penn State among those in his last cut decided to come here to Georgia Tech. Skinner wide, oh 
open. Oh my goodness, Marshall Williams, the leading receiver, had a lot of space in front of Mario Butler to pick up the first down. But well, Butler is just giving a lot of respect over there. He totally bails out. Look at him getting not even into a back battle. He's turning and running right from the get-go. And that's that's not sound technique. You got to get into your back pedal so that you don't create such such a, a wide cushion and allow the man to hitch up at the sticks. I mean, that was third and ten. Now it's first and ten. From the 18. Second time Wake has been into the red zone. Scored the first time, zipping it out to Devon Brown who lost the football and picked it up. Boy, Wake Forest has really struggled. They are minus five coming into this game in turnover margin after really under Jim Groh being one of the leaders perennially in that department. Yeah, he never had this ball. This should just be an incomplete pass. You see, he's just bobbling it the whole, whole way. Well, it's an incompletion. Second down, 11. Brown knew he should have hung on to that. I think on the field they called it a fumble. Yeah, they called it a run. We just assumed in the second look that it was a, as you mentioned, he never had control of the football. And it's, it's only going to change the thing by a, a half a yard. Yeah, there's no, uh, no, way. no point. That's called it a, that's, right now a backward uh, pass. That's spilled milk, and that's not a and backward pass either. That's, nope. that's forward by three yards. And I believe there is indisputable video evidence that that is an incomplete pass. And Jack McElwee is up in the replay booth along with Ted Jackson between the two of them. 60 years of officiating. And I think those guys will get it right. Had a good conversation with them prior to the game. And it is only a, a one yard difference, you're right. And uh, the quick decision. After further review, the ruling on the field is overruled. We have an incomplete pass. The second down at the previous spot at the 18 yard line. Yeah, the ruling on the field was that it was not an incomplete pass, and now they have got it correct. And the other thing it'll move is move the ball back to the right hash. So it's going to be a second and 10 at the 18 instead of a second and 11 at the 19. So it's just a, a one yard difference. And uh, in the spot of the ball, as we mentioned, moving over to the right hash. Two minutes and 18 seconds left to go. Wake with all three of its timeouts. We have some Wake coaches on the field now. Yeah, that, and Paul Johnson wants to know why. Steve, Steve Lebotsky, the offensive coordinator, going out to get a little extra info. Coming up on ABC Tuesday, the number one new drama on television arrived. ABC's V, all new Tuesday at 8, 7 central on ABC. So they're going to put more time on the clock. 2.47 is what... Gary Patterson is asking for. Yeah, because of the incomplete pass, that clock should have stopped immediately. That one might even get another playoff here. <laughs> wow. Much ado about nothing. Second and 10 from the 18. Skinner under duress. Wide open, Renfret could not bring it in. He's made a couple of catches already today. And that one could not be completed. I'll tell you, Riley Skinner is so impressive moving around the pocket, buying time. And this one should have been caught by Renfret. Like he mistimed it a little bit. His feet weren't right to get any kind of elevation. Never really jumped for the ball like he should have. He's a big guy at 6'3", 260. Maybe that is all he can jump. Yeah. <laughs> Over a couple of phone, phone books. Third and ten. Skinner, a 
looking into the end zone and a perfectly thrown pass, but incomplete. Boy, he dropped it in there over Mario Butler. But Gibbons couldn't get it in bounds. Yeah, Butler ends up with the football after the whole thing. But I don't believe he has it while he's in bounds. Heck of a throw by Skinner going to that back shoulder. And Butler again gets turned around. And there's ends up really with dual possession a little bit. But by the time Butler did have control, he was clearly out of bounds. So here's a 35-yard field goal attempt by Jimmy Newman. Hit on a 19-yarder that was wiped out by roughing the kicker earlier in this quarter. The Wake Forest has 17 points here in the second quarter. They lead number 10, Georgia Tech, by seven. Been to Georgia Tech up by 10 after one quarter here of Wake Forest behind Riley Skinner. Three straight scoring drives, outscoring the number 10 team in the country. 17 to nothing in this quarter. Klein Beam kicks him into the end zone regularly, does it again. Let's go back to our Affleck trivia question. Affleck. The answer, or the question is, Ron Dayton won the 1999 Heisman Trophy. Who finished second? There's a hint. He's in this stadium, and he's right there. There's our man, Joe Hamilton. Yep. The glasses on top of his head, a terrific quarterback at Georgia Tech, went into the Georgia Tech Hall of Fame. He was, there was a big ceremony for him last night, and one of the most beloved athletes, really, probably ever to play here. Yeah, they, they just love them some Joey Hamilton <laughs> around here. He finished second to Mr. Dane. All right, two timeouts left to go. Josh Nesbitt tries to get it going. There's a good start, but he one hops it to Demarius Thomas. By far his favorite target this season. And yeah, Nesbitt tried to flatten Thomas out. Normally that's a go route. And because of the good coverage, he tried to flatten him out, throw him inside a little short, but he flattened him out too much. And now Georgia Tech, which usually is pretty good on the long passes, 0 for 4 on the deep shots so far today. Nesbitt overall just 1 for 6 for 12 yards. That a completion to Thomas in the first quarter. Here's a second and 10. Nesbitt backpedaling, throws it right in the middle. Dangerous pass. And it's incomplete. Embry Peoples was the closest Georgia Tech player to it. So this is Georgia Tech, number 10 in the BCS standings, riding a six-game winning streak where Paul Johnson's team busted out to a 10 to nothing lead. It has been Wake Forest ever since. And Georgia Tech, number two in the nation in rushing, leading in the rushing department here, but not in the... And not in yards and not in time of possession. They also lead the nation in time of possession. Nesbitt throwing it downfield and it is intercepted. Just threw it up for grabs. Kenny Okoro got in front of Tyler Melton and that was that was just a ball that Nesbitt threw up there. And you see him do that a lot of times when Demarius Thomas is the intended receiver. But this one he throws to Melton. Melton had kind of given up on the thing, and Okoro stayed with it playing center field. There it is up at the top of your screen, and you see Melton kind of give up on it and quit a little bit, and Nesbitt's going to throw it up. And they hope for a jump ball for his guy, and Okoro is the only one there. And he had a nice return into... Yellow Jacket territory. Okoro's third interception of the season. He had a couple of them against Stanford earlier this year. Can Riley Skinner take him down to another score? Escape the sack and then threw it towards Kevin Harris, but he was step for step with Cedric Griffin. Harris runs the wheel route out of the backfield. But I continue to be amazed by Riley Skinner's ability to move in and around the pocket and escape people. Logan Walls almost had him that time, but Skinner's able to get away and make throws. He's completed 66% of his passes this season. Very crafty quarterback. Second and ten. Dumps it over the middle in traffic, but complete 
to Devon Brown, stopped about a yard short of the first down by Gerard Tarrant. And this is a deal, Pam, where they throw two into the strong hook zone. The tight end, Bohannon, ran up the field, and that clears out that hook defender, and then they, Devon Brown just runs into that little wake area that's open, and Skinner dumps it down. Skinner's doing well on four downs so far this afternoon. This is a third and one. And they will indeed throw for it again. Here comes the pressure. Skinner didn't even see Steven Sylvester coming. Sylvester drops him for a seven-yard loss on the sack. All right, and that's just a blown protection because you've got a guy coming off the edge free. And there was nobody there to pick him up. That ball's either got to come out of your hands quicker or someone's got to block Sylvester. And what do you think of that play call? It was third and one, and they're throwing for it. At, they've had trouble running the ball straight ahead, but I thought they were in four-down territory, and a run wouldn't have been a bad selection. Instead, they have no choice but to punt it away on fourth and eight. Flag is down at the line of scrimmage. Poppins punt takes a great Wake Forest roll. They down it inside the two-yard line. Well, we check the flag back at the 45-yard line. May well be offsides. And that would not give legal motion legal motor, number 17. I take 15, it back. The illegal yard. motion. The P4 down. So. So you erase that terrific 40-yard punt that died inside the two. Yeah, that that hurts because Georgia Tech is a very good punt return team. In fact, Gerard Tarrant has a couple of returns for touchdowns this year, including an 85-yarder. Against Clemson, he is first in the ACC, ninth in the nation, averaging over 16 yards per punt return. He stands back at his 10. And a timeout taken Georgia Tech. by Georgia Tech. So we come back, Tarrant, one of the best punt returners in the country, has a chance. At Georgia. Well, welcome back. Here is Shane Poppins' punt. A rugby-style punt, wisely trying to keep it away from Tarrant. And they down it inside the five again. Good coverage on the punt by Greg Bechtel, who is a deep snapper getting down there in a hurry. Excellent punt there by Popham. And you can see the consternation on the face of Paul Johnson. Things have not gone well here in the second quarter. As they have really hurt themselves with the penalties. Nick Nesbitt throws it up here. What do you do? I think you run your option. Maybe you pop a big one. But you don't want to take any chances. Throwing the football has not been a strength for him so far. Especially in this field position. I think you're going to see just a little dive to the fullback here. Snapping it from the four-yard line. Not even that, just a sneak and go in and lick the wounds at halftime. And Georgia Tech led 10-0 after one quarter of play. Wake out scores him 17-zip in the second quarter. Nesbitt just one for eight through the year through the air for 12 yards and Wake Forest which has been bitten with some bad luck during the season to fall to four and five take a 17 to 10 lead into the locker room. to Atlanta. Second half about to get underway between Wake Forest and Georgia Tech. The Yellow Jackets coming in 10th in the BCS standings and their winning streak of six straight games on the line. Georgia Tech kicks off. Lavelle Jackson gets it for the Demon Deacons and he is taken down around the 15 yard line by Martin Frierson, a backup cornerback. Let's take a look now at the Pacific Life game summary. Georgia Tech out to a great start. At one point led this game 10 to nothing, but then uh, some bad penalties, and here come the Demon Deacons. Yeah, I think the penalties has really been what has changed the tenor of this game. It started out 
All Georgia Tech blew out to that 10 nothing lead and then the penalty started just tipping away at him and had him at the worst times and then Wake Forest got a little confidence got a little momentum. And they have it to start off the second half Riley Skinner back from last week's concussion. It's been sacked a couple of times but looking good as he hits Marshall Williams for a five yard game. Rashad Reed credit him with the tackle for Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech's only loss on the season came in week three at Miami. Since then they have ripped off six straight wins under Paul Johnson. And they are uh, off to their best nine game start since their national championship season. Facing some trouble against Wake. Handoff to Josh Adams, who was tackled down by Logan Walls. Let's take a look at some of the highlights from the first half. It started out all Georgia Tech. Here's the option running Preston Lyons on the pitch. But then it turned into the Wake Forest show in the second half as Riley Skinner heated things up. Got the touchdown pass here to Devon Brown. And the little penalties have killed the Yellow Jackets. But they and Pam are a second half football team. And the second half has been bad for Wake Forest. So we'll see if those things play out here as we move on to this game. Skinner on third and three. Fires it into traffic. He's lucky that wasn't intercepted. Boy, Mario Edwards got in front of that pass intended for Devon Brown. Skinner late with the throw. That's the second time I've seen him late on the corner route with the throw, and both of them should have been intercepted. This one, Mario Edwards, that's got to be your football right there. He beat it up a little bit, and then you see him just pounding on the turf. Knowing he missed an opportunity there, but nonetheless a punt now from Wade. Edwards' first career start. Shane Popham into punt. Tarrant, again a terrific punt returner. They've been trying to keep it away from him all game. This time no fair catch. Gets it at the 35. Great coverage again by the Demon Deacons. Kyle Quarles is starting a starting safety. Drop Tarrant after only a six-yard return. But still Georgia Tech in pretty good field possession. Field position for Josh Nesbitt, who struggled in the first half, both throwing the ball and running. And credit Wake Forest defense for that. They've done a nice job after getting things kind of situated. And taking away that option, what's hurt them the most, as you see the comparisons on those numbers, what's hurt them most early is the pitch. And right up the middle, Jonathan Dwyer, one man to beat. He won't get to him. Dwyer busting loose for a 59-yard touchdown. Well, inside trap action. Cord Howard, the six-foot-five, 308. Fifth-year senior came around through a beautiful log block. Dwyer got in behind it and then showed you the burst. He's a straight-line runner, and that time the end of that straight line was the end zone. Scott Blair adds the extra point. One week after Dwyer ran for a career high 186 yards. What a way to start the second half for Georgia Tech. He's gone on a 59 yard run to tie the game. Well, we are back in Atlanta where the sun has started to set. What a terrific start for Georgia Tech. One play, 59 yards. It's a touchdown for Jonathan Dwyer to tie this game up at 17 apiece. The ninth rushing touchdown for Dwyer this season. Georgia Tech, as we mentioned, has been uh, quite good in the second half of games. Last week at Vanderbilt. It was 28-28 at the half, and Georgia Tech ended up winning at 56-31. They just blew them out. Blair's kickoff, fielded by Lavelle Jackson at the goal line. 
Jackson with a head of steam, abruptly stopped at the 22-yard line. All right, time now for, here's the city inside view, Pam. And we'll take a look at this trap. Here it is right here. There's your offensive lineman coming around, going to log block. That's big number 71, Cord Howard. Watch him turn the shoulders of the defensive lineman, Tristan Doherty. That creates the seam for Jonathan Dwyer. And when Dwyer gets out in the open field, he's got the speed to go the distance. There's those two guys sitting right next to each other saying, didn't we do good? They were quite the tandem. Dwyer now over 100 yards for the 15th time in his career. Pendergrass stopped. Let's go back to our Times Square studio and Matt Weiner. All right, Pam, time for our AT&T All-America Player of the Week update. Texas receiver Jordan Shipley was all over the field against Central Florida, racking up 11 catches and a school record 273 yards in the Longhorns' run. Text vote to 345-345 for your mobile phone. You could win a trip to the national championship. Matt, boy, what a combination. Shipley, Colt McCoy, Texas looking awfully good. Georgia Tech fans getting vocal now that this game has been tied up. Second and seven for Riley Skinner. Takes the handoff and bought enough time to find Marshall Williams. They're saying he caught it in bounds. I don't think so. I think he was bobbling the football. This will probably be looked at upstairs. We'll take a look at it ourselves at the end. Previous Does he continue? I don't know. The coach kind of got in the way. I don't know if that was a bobble or not. Got it. The foot's in. Yeah, the ball rolls in his hand. So that should be an incomplete pass after they look at it. I believe that's inconclusive video evidence that he did not have control of the ball before he went out of bounds. You need the indisputable video evidence to overturn the call on the field, which is a catch. We will have that decision when we come back. This Jack Marshall Williams has indeed been credited for that catch on the sidelines. The ruling on the field stands. They took a look at it upstairs. So first and ten at the 36. Shocking. Wake. Shocking decision. I guess they figured there wasn't indisputable video evidence to show he didn't catch it. to dispute that. You're disputing the indisputable. Yeah. <laughs> Can you do that? Yeah, absolutely. Gibbons with the catch gets it down to the 40. Morgan Burnett comes up, gets him after a four-yard gain. Tackle made by number one, Morgan Burnett. Wake Forest, a team that has been snake bitten under Jim Grove. He's talked about it, and you know, not this is again the last guy who will make any excuses, but it probably be hard pressed to you know, one play here or there, and these in four of the five games they lost, and they could have been winners. And plays that they have been making during Jim Grove's tenure. Boy, has he done a great job at Wake Forest. Outstanding. What a great guy. Second and six. No play. Yep. Thought I heard a whistle, but Skinner wishes there was a whistle. He's taken down by Morgan. Sack for a five-yard loss by Morgan, who leads the ACC in sacks and gets another one. Yeah, and you're going to see him work upfield and then come around underneath Logan Walls, a little E or TE stunt, where the tackle will go outside and kind of pick the man that's blocking him. He'll circle in behind, and it was very effective that time. Riley Skinner, as elusive as he is, couldn't get away from Derek Morgan on that play. He's from Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Loved his visit to Georgia Tech, so he said thanks, but no thanks to schools like Penn State. Third and 11 after the sack. Skinner buys a little bit more time and overthrows his intended receiver, Devon Brown. Rashad Reed back there with the coverage. And Skinner just overthrew this one. There really wasn't a lot of pressure. Pretty nice coverage there by Reed. And Skinner threw it out there where if anyone could get it, only his receiver could. But he couldn't. Brings Popham out to punt to Tarrant. First in the ACC, ninth in the nation in punt returns. Good punt by Popham to make him retreat back to the 17. But he has room up the left side. Tarrant taken down. 
at the 38-yard line by Brandon G, the starting corner. That's a nifty 21-yard return for Tarrant, which is above his season average. Number 46. Saturday Night Football continues with regional action. Most of the nation will see Brian Kelly, Cincinnati Bearcats, take on Connecticut. Other parts get Oklahoma, Nebraska, or USC, Arizona State. Check your local listings for the game in your area. Saturday Night Football presented by Southwest Airlines on ABC at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. And boy, did USC just get thumped by Oregon. But Oregon's getting thumped by Stanford today. It's been a crazy day. Yeah, I think it's that day, Pam. Tyler Melton gets the first down. Okoro rides him out of bounds, but he got 13 yards. This Georgia Tech offense, as well as they do possessing the ball, they still can quick hit you. I mean, look at the, all these touchdown drives that they've had in a quick order. And that last one, just a 10-second, 59-yarder. That's how long it took uh, Jonathan Dwyer to run it into the end zone. That's only the second completion for Josh Nesbitt on the day. Nesbitt pitches it to Roddy Jones. Jones with some real estate gets the first down. G with the stop low. And this is the full triple option. You're going to see the dive is going to come here. The pitch is going to come around here. And it's great reads by the quarterback Nesbitt all the way. He read it. He pulled it. The pressure was on him, he pitched it, and so far today, eight pitches for 133 yards and a touchdown from Josh Nesbitt at that quarterback position. And he runs the option away. 239 rush yards now for Tech. Another yard there for Jonathan Dwyer. And the, the thing about the option that works so well, Pam, is they take what is there. And so far today, the thing that's been there, is right there the pitch they take wake forest being they have taken away the dive they've taken away the keep from the quarterback but they forgot about that pitch getting burned by the pitch still tied up nesbitt this time keeps it gets inside the 30. he's a load ain't he? that's a quarterback running over somebody josh bush just felt the wrath Nesbitt at 6'1", 214. Listen to this. Our audio guy, Andy Bartley, laying it out for you. Great job by Nesbitt to, to lay it out. And re remember, he was recruited by Chan Gailey, shotgun quarterback in high school. And boy, has he adapted very well to this new offense. Third and two. Herman missed the tackle, but Russell did not. Embry Peoples taken down, actually lost a yard on that play. So here's a fourth and three. What do you do? They like to go for it a lot of times. Oh, yeah, I think especially the way this offense has been clicking so far here early on in this second half, that they'll go for it without a doubt. Paul Johnson acting as his own offensive coordinator. No call sheets, no play sheets. He's as good as it gets, as far as I'm concerned. He just has a great feel. A master of this offense. Fourth and three, they are indeed going for it. Nesbitt decides not to pitch, and he is stopped well short. Oh, that was a mistake by Josh Nesbitt. Flag is down. But he's got to pitch that football. That's twice today. I think he has made a mistake in terms of not pitching. Now, if you're in doubt as a quarterback in this, you don't want to pitch it. Second chop block called against Georgia Tech in this game, but they were stopped short of the first down anyway. Paul's upset about it. This is good defense here by Wake Forest. Coming off the edge is Ehrman. He's the one that's really going to get in and make the play right there. He, well, he missed the play. If it was flag football, he would have been in good shape. He ripped the towel off of Nesbitt, but he was the one that took the pitch away. I'm going to take my criticism of Nesbitt back. Ehrman was in position to possibly knock that pitch down, and so I think Nesbitt did the right thing by taking it and keeping it. So Georgia Tech 0 for 2 on fourth down today. Riley Skinner hits Devon Brown in front of Mario Butler. 
Joey Ehrman, who you just talked about, is the son of Joe Ehrman, who those great Baltimore Colt fans remember Big Joe playing for them, and Joey grew up in Baltimore. Another undersized linebacker making an impact for Wake Forest. Second down and three. Second and three for Riley Skinner. Coming back from that mild concussion last week, suffered in the loss to Miami. When he was taken out of the game, they were actually winning the game. And on second down, he hands it off to Harris, who gets bottled up, close to the line of scrimmage by Brad Jefferson. Let's head back to the studio on that one. Hi, Pam Sports Center right now is presented by Sprint. Number three, Alabama is taking the lead on LSU. Greg McElroy hits Darius Hanks here. 10-7 games the tie, trying to wrap up the SEC West title. Meanwhile, number eight, Oregon trailing all day at Stanford. The Cardinal have put together four long touchdown drives. The Ducks have stayed in it with big plays, including that one, and it's a 10-point game. Thank you, Matt. Some terrific games all across the country. Here we have a 17 all tie and a third and three for Wake. Trying to take down the number 10 team in the country. The blitz is picked up. Skinner takes a shot downfield just over the outstretched fingertips of Marshall Williams. Skinner took another hit. This is the blitz beater side. Skinner saw the blitz coming, knew he had man to man coverage, so he takes the deep shot. And Tarrant is able to, or Tarrant, excuse me, is able to take away Marshall Williams. A little bit overthrown there. Shane Popham in for another punt. Tarrant stays out there to field it. Popham's gotten some good ones off today. Tarrant taken down by Bechtel. The deep snapper has a couple of big plays today on special teams. This January on ABC. Welcome back. We are on the campus of Georgia Tech, a team that has won four national championships, the last one back in 1990. That was the last time they got off to a start as good as this one. Georgia Tech 8 and 1 on the season. With the football again, Nesbitt. Hands it off to Jonathan Dwyer, who scored on a 59-yard touchdown today. Dwyer's a special back, Pam, because not only is he that fullback who takes it on the dive, but when they run the speed option and the counter options, he's the pitch guy who can also get it done around the perimeter. So he is so multi-talented. He's kind of two, two backs in one. The reigning ACC Player of the Year gained about, well, just short of 1,400 yards, in fact, last season. Over 100 yards for the 15th time in his career today. There's a pitch to Roddy Jones. Jones gets the first down and more taken out around the 32-yard line. Picked up 11. So this Georgia Tech offense really has been a juggernaut. First in the ACC in scoring, second in the entire nation in rushing, first in the nation in time of possession. Well, they have been bottled up a little bit. Yeah, there's those things you were talking about, Pam, and so far today haven't quite hit the standards of their previous performances. Wake Forest has had the ball about four and a half minutes longer than Georgia Tech. Only twice have teams had the ball longer than Tech this year, one of them in their loss to Miami. Marcus Wright continues to fight up to the 40-yard line. The only other time they didn't win the time of possession was in their first game against Jacksonville State. They won that one by 20. 20 points. Georgia Tech's only loss coming at Miami in the third game of the season. Paul Johnson coming here from Navy with this spread option. A lot of people said it wouldn't work here. And I'm sure he's answered those questions many times. He has made it work here. <laughs> yes, he has. It worked very well. Thank you. When we were talking to him, he said he used to run this offense back in high school, back at Avery County High School, where he played some center. First down run for Dwyer. Picks up five more. Tristan Doherty with the stop. 
you know, one of the knocks on this offense is, uh, is the recruiting. But when we spoke to him about it, he says, you know, he can pop holes into all those different things where, you know, just take a look at Demarius Thomas, their wide receiver, who is number two in the nation in terms of yards per catch. There are opportunities for receivers, great opportunities for linemen. If you come here, you can run block, and that's what the pros are interested in. You know, they can teach you to pass block. So there's a lot of benefits in this offense. Stephen Hill couldn't come up with that one. In fact, Demarius Thomas, when we talked to him yesterday, he had a huge smile on his face because he's like a kid in a candy store, right, with a single coverage every time. He looked like the cat but ate the canary. <laughs> Thought about transferring when Chan Gailey was let go and he heard that the spread option was coming, but boy, has it worked out for him. Yeah, Demarius, an interesting story. His father, Bobby Thomas, been in the Army for 21 years. He, he was sixth grade. He moved in with his uncle, James Brown, who was a preacher. He said he really kept him in line, had to put a curfew on, kept him out of trouble. And right up the middle, a carry for Dwyer, just short of midfield. In fact, Demaris' nickname is Bebe for the Bay Bebe kids. His, uh, his aunt gave him that nickname, I guess because uh, he, let's say, was a little mischievous. Yeah, the, the Bebe <laughs> kids were bad kids, if you don't remember that. And said he was between the age of one and two, and, and his auntie said, you know what, you want them Bebe kids. <laughs> and you see on the, the jersey, it says B Thomas, not D Thomas for Demarius, but B. Uh, the equipment guy heard him called Bebe all the time, so the B is on the jersey. Another pitch out to Dwyer, who gets away from an arm tackle. And picks up yet another Georgia Tech first down. There's nine yards, and here is this Georgia Tech ball control offense. That was an impressive shifting of gears by Jonathan Dwyer, because Dominique Majette had an angle on him. And he just put it into the next gear and runs past him. Right here, watch this. Makes that little step in move and then runs right past Majette. So they're into Wake Forest territory. Preston Lyons, who has scored a touchdown, a 31 yard touchdown, back in there. Spins down to the 35 yard line. Hunter Haynes with the stop. And savvy fans will notice that Georgia Tech is not wearing its customary white uniforms at home. The away team has the option to say whether or not that can be. The Wake Forest players said they wanted to wear white. Georgia Tech going with the gold shirts and the white pants. They've been wearing all whites at home since Paul Johnson got the job. And there was talk about gold pants and gold shirts, and Paul Johnson nixed that. He said, no, they're going to look like French fries. Big old French fries. He said he's never seen more discussion and, and worry about a jersey being worn in his entire career. In fact, when he got the job here, Last year, he said he had a lot of alumni and people contacting him via email or phone calls concerned about what jersey he was going to wear. A lot of people don't want the blue jersey. I don't want them blue jerseys. Never done good in them. Then Paul said, you know, I saw a picture of the 1990 National Championship team in blue jerseys. Yeah, that kind of worked out. Yeah. So he nixed the French fry look, and they've just gone with the gold pants, or the uh, gold jerseys with the white pants. Here's the third and fourth for him. Dwyer, right up the middle, stop short. They are 0 for 2 on fourth down so far today. There's a flag on the field. Another chop block. That's the third time it's been called today. And we talked to Coach Johnson about that, and he said, we call it a scoop chop gap. Block, block. 71 out there. 15 yards. And the way that works is, you know, that, that backside blocker is scooping into the gap. And so you're going to see here and here and here. They're all scooping, stepping that way. And sometimes you're going to end up with two on one just because that's how it works. And you see the high low. And the problem with that was the center, Sean Bedford, didn't bring his feet with him. And he ended up down low. And so now you get the double team, the high low, and that's what you can't have. But the contact was initiated up top. And that brings up a third and 19 for Tech. Nesbitt dropping back, pursued by Ehrman. It's complete, but well short of the first down. Thomas hit right away by Brandon G, who is drawing the 
single covered. So they pick up 12. Third quarter coming to a close. And I bet they go for it here, Pam. Kind of no man's land. You're certainly not in field goal range yet. And yet you hate to have to punt the football from this area. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, he's going to have the time to think about it as we change quarters. I would be surprised if he went, though. It's fourth and seven. Georgia Tech knotted up at 17 apiece with weight. First play of the fourth quarter coming up. Georgia Tech is indeed going for it on fourth and seven. They are 0 for 2 so far on fourth downs today. Preston Lyons behind Nesbitt in the backfield. Passing formation. Nesbitt looking, and he had it right in the hands of Anthony Allen, who dropped the first down pass. Would have been a first down. Ball was a little bit behind on that back shoulder of Anthony Allen, but he's got to bring that one in. I mean, it hit him in both hands. Here it is, just hitching the sticks, basically. Run out to a yard or two past the first down marker. Turn around. Ball should be there. It is Allen not able to grab it in. Third time. Georgia Tech has been denied on fourth down here today. Wake Forest with the ball. Good field position at their own 38. Skinner got rid of it, and it's completed right back to him. Rashad Reed tipped it, and Skinner caught it. Would have been better served to let it go. They lose a couple of yards. Yeah, I don't think this is too bad of a decision. But there it is, and he sees he's got a little bit of room, but he's not going to take the chance of getting hit again. He probably could have gotten his way, you know, a few more yards, but I'm sure Riley Skinner is under strict orders not to be a hero. Yeah, you certainly understand the instinct for him to catch it, and he did have a little bit of real estate, but coming off that concussion last week, you don't want him to get hit at all. So it's second and 12. Flings it out to Williams, slips a would-be tackle. And is vaulted down by Morgan Burnett, seven-yard game. Time to take a look at the Pacific Life game summary. Georgia Tech out to a 10-0 lead after one quarter. Wick has got 17 unanswered in the second. And a 59-yard touchdown run by Jonathan Dwyer has evened it up. And there's that Tech rushing attack. All right, they, they do run the football well, but the passing game has let them down, whether it be drop passes or overthrows on the deep balls by Josh Nesbitt. There's been some opportunity there. They haven't gotten it. First time Wake has shown this four wide receiver set on third and five. Skinner with time, throws into double coverage, looking for Chris Gibbons, but it falls incomplete. Wake Forest punt coming up. Riley Skinner got impatient. That's the first time all day. I believe he got impatient. He had a man coming open underneath on a little drag route. He went for all the marbles instead of dropping it down and moving the chains. Pretty uncharacteristic. Shane Popham, who's done a good job punting. Kicking towards Tarrant. Backs him up again. The ball just dribbles in to the end zone. So Georgia Tech taking over from the 20, the number 10 team in the country, in a dogfight with Riley Skinner and Wade. Check out the CMA Awards coming your way live Wednesday night on ABC at 8 Eastern Time. All right, Green Man. I wonder if he can breathe in there. I assume so. He's alive. Nesbitt takes a deep shot for Thomas. And it is knocked away. Good play by Brandon G, who's been challenged all day against a very talented wide receiver. Josh Nesbitt, just 3 of 13 in the passing game, 0 for 6 on his deep shots. And here's Bebe going up trying to get it. Outstanding play by G, getting that thing at the high pointing the football up at the top and then knocking it away. And, you know, you wonder why hasn't this Tech offense been as successful? They're getting nothing for the passing game, Pam. Thomas with two catches for 24 yards. He averages over 24 yards per catch. 
on the season, but they've done a good job on him. Dwyer picked up about four tough yards on that carry. And to further that discussion, I think Wake Forest has done an outstanding job taking away the dive, except for the one play, the 59-yarder to start the second half, and the quarterback. Not a lot of yards, not a lot of production out of the dive and the keep. Those are, if you stop those, you got a half a chance. And then the pitch has really been what's hurt them, but Tech hasn't been able to get to that one. That's the hardest one to get to. And here they are facing the third and six. Nesbitt has to throw it again. Thomas grabs it, yards after catch, gets him the first down. 14 yards. Good block by Phil Smith, who's in there for Austin Barrick. He was able to get G. We used to call this play Tex Quick, where you release your offensive tackle to go block the corner. The timing of it was immaculate and move the chains, and they finally get something out of the passing game, does the Yellow Jackets. And there is a Wake Forest defender. That's G down on the ground. Shaken up a little bit after Phil Smith went after him. G, the senior from Fayetteville, North Carolina, has had the very difficult task of having to find Demarius Thomas whenever he's on the, whenever he's out there. Wake Forest in the very first play of the game. In fact, the opening kickoff. Number 17, Brandon G. Lost Lee Malco, and we have word now that Malco did indeed break a bone in his leg on that play. Ouch. BCS standings, we got Georgia Tech number 10 right there, and obviously they are tied right now. We've had some, uh, of course, Iowa going down for the first time today. Ricky Stanzi went out in that game. And uh, finally, they were unable to come back from a fourth quarter deficit. They've been living on some borrowed time, have they not? Oregon and LSU both trailing, but that boy, we expected Alabama and LSU to be a low scoring game, now 10 to nine, a tight one. And Stanford looking really good against Oregon. Florida taking on Vandy later today. So G is out. And Dominique Tate, who is a true freshman, number 29, checks in for him at the corner spot. I think they'll be uh, checking him out, testing him out before this drive is over. The coral is on Thomas, the more experienced corner. There's a pitch to Roddy Jones. And he is marked close to the first down. Jonathan Jones making the stop for Wake. And I hear people call this play a toss, but to me it's a quick pitch. Just because of the position of the back and where he's receiving that pitch, he's almost all the way outside the tackle by the time he gets the ball. Watch where he is. He's going to come out and he's going to receive that ball right over here outside the tackle. So that, that's way outside the tackle. That's outside the tight end. That's a quick pitch, not a toss. Second down and short. And they have measured, and it is just a couple of inches short of the first down. G getting his right foot all taped up, so we expect to see him come back in, and the sooner the better, I'm sure, for, for Jim Grove to get his best cover guy back out there. That is one link shy. I've been accused of being that myself. <laughs> At least one link. <laughs> so second and one for Georgia Tech. 4-0 at home on top of the Coastal Division along with very surprising Duke. Boy, Thaddeus Lewis has been terrific. Like Riley Skinner has thrown for over 2,000 yards all four years of his time on campus. Tech now over 300 yards on the ground. They get the first down, plus from Jonathan Dwight into Wake Forest territory. And this is a play off the series of that motion, that wide motion. When you get that wide motion, which they had earlier, and they got two guys over on the wing there, that's that quick pitch formation. And so you got the defense thinking they're going to have to get wide, and then what they do is they run it up the gut with the fullback. Really nice scheme there for Paul Johnson's offense. Dwyer scored on a 59-yard run. In the third quarter, Roddy Jones is turned to take it. Induced out of bounds by Kyle Quarles. Jones was a very good baseball player. In fact, drafted by the Chicago White Sox right out of high school. Decided to come and play football at Georgia Tech. Got himself a pretty nice crack back block from Embry Peoples on that play to really open things up. Second down and four from the 36.
Second and four, Dwyer in the backfield. There's Jones in motion, but they give it to Dwyer. And close to another first down as we go back to our Times Square studio and Matt Weiner. All right, Pam, a lot going on in Tuscaloosa right now. LSU recorded a safety, then scored when they got the ball back. Stephen Ridley finishes off a 59-yard drive, two-pointer miss, so it's 15-10. Navy upset Notre Dame under BCS rules. The Irish's third loss officially removes them from BCS consideration. How about that? There's an option for you. Navy pulling off the upset in South Bend. Paul well, Johnson's old uh, stomping grounds at the Naval Academy. A uh, way to get out of trouble. Anthony Allen still going down to the 15-yard line. What a run for Allen. Get a great block again on the edge. They're just crack back blocking this. This is just the old crack. Quick pitch right here, and you're going to see right here is the, is the crackback block. He's going to come down. Bam, right there, cracking on Ehrman. Now you got three guys out leading the way, including Phil Smith, the tackle, and Marcus Wright, the receiver. You pin the edge with the crack, and then you get two, three guys rolling on the edge, and you got a ball carrier, student body, right or left. Now the transfer from Louisville, Dwyer contact right away. By Jello Orange, and he's driven back. Fire on the carry. Well, Georgia Tech in position to try to take the lead. They led 10-0 after one quarter, and then Wake out scored them 17-0 in the second quarter. That broke a string of 11 straight quarters in which Georgia Tech had scored. This offense will take a cumulative effect on a defense. The way they just keep hammering and pounding with that option and with the size of the backs, and they roll fresh guys in, and it takes a toll. They've already gone 65 yards on this drive and have indeed taken over the time of possession lead. Nesbitt hanging on to it, spinning down inside the 15-yard line. Let's take a look at update these option the option output of this offense. You see the dive really got a lot. He got 59 of those yards on one pop. But where it's been happening is on the perimeter in that pitch. The pitch has been real good to the Yellow Jackets today. When Nesbitt has been able to get to it. Georgia Tech touchdowns. Preston Lyons with a 31-yard run. And then Jonathan Dwyer with that 59-yarder. That one big dive play Ray referenced. Nesbitt. Taken off and in to the end zone. Georgia Tech takes the lead back. This is a really nice play from Paul Johnson. Spread them out. Called the three step quarterback draw at the lead block from Dwyer. And Nesbitt dangerous when he runs straight lines. And he kept his shoulder square. 14th rushing touchdown of the season for the quarterback. Georgia Tech now with 35 touchdowns scored on the ground. The Rambler Wreck back on top. in Atlanta where Josh Nesbitt has just taken the ball in from 12 yards out capping an 80 yard 11 play drive that ended up just short of five minutes on the clock. Georgia Tech number 10 in the BCS standings with a touchdown lead over Wake Forest. Riley Skinner about to go back to work. Lavell Jackson takes the kick at his five. Battles out to around the 26-yard line, where he is tackled down by Jamea Thomas. 21-yard return. return. Only three races remain in the chase for the cup. Jimmy Johnson holds a commanding lead as he goes for his fourth straight championship. That would be unprecedented. The Dickies 500 at Texas comes your way tomorrow, Sunday at 2.30 Eastern time on ABC. Coverage begins with NASCAR countdown, and there you see the chunky 184-point lead for Jimmy Johnson over Mark Martin. You got a Wake Forest player down. That's Chris Givens. Got a 
few injuries for Wake in this game, the most serious of which happened to Lee Malko, who broke his leg in the opening kick for the Deeks. So here's Riley Skinner trying to bring Wake Forest back from this seven-point deficit. You've got to give this Georgia Tech defense some credit. Halftime adjustments made by Dave Womack have really worked. And Skinner not nearly effective in the second half as he was in the first half when they really had things going nicely. Skinner had already thrown for 150 yards and a touchdown in the first half. And look at the second half. Good completion percentage, but just little dinks. No production. First down from the 26. Pendergrass, nice game. Stop short of the 35-yard line by Mario Edwards. Picked up eight. Riley Skinner, the winningest quarterback in the history of Wake Forest. 30 victories coming in to this game. And this is a key drive right here. I believe the Deacons have to get some, some kind of points on the board, preferably for them, a touchdown to tie this thing up because the Georgia Tech offense seems to be hitting its stride. 232 yards, in fact, for Tech in this half. Pendergrass again. This time he can't get outside of Cedric Griffin, the senior coming around to drop him for a three-yard loss. Griffin just does a great job. Here he is, freezer right here. Here's Griffin. Watch him. He's almost outflanked by the two blockers coming around at him. He's going to get split him actually and keep outside arm free, keeping that leverage, beating Joe Birdsong's block, and then making the tackle for a loss. Six tackles for Griffin on the day. Came into this game second on the team in tackles for the season. Here's a big third and five. Skinner on the roll. What a pass. Gets it right into Chris Givens for the first down. Zipped it in there for a 13-yard gain. It didn't look like he had a lot of room out there. That was a dime right there. He's going to be throwing on the run. And look at how sound he is mechanically. There is no wasted movement or motion from Riley Skinner. And I think that gives him a chance to play at the next level. Some people question the arm strength, but the accuracy is uncanny, and the mechanics are as good as it gets. In his career, a 67% completion rate. That was a big one on third and five. Back to Pendergrass, dances around, and then is bottled up for a loss. Brad Jefferson, one of the linebackers, coming in to drop him for a two-yard loss. You cannot run sideways or, or dance due to jitterbug against this Tech defense. The best way to attack him is quickly straight up the field or quickly to the edge decisively. The more you dance around or, or are indecisive, they will rally to the football. Wake Forest with 23 rushing yards, only three rushing yards this second half. They lost two on that play. And the grass this time just runs upfield, all the way up to midfield, picks up eight. Huge difference in that run compared to the previous ones where there was hesitation and, and a lot of shake and bake that goes nowhere. This time it's straight ahead. He's just going to take that snap and run right up the field. Keeping the shoulders square. You see the hole fighting his way through it at the end. That's how you need to run the football against this Tech defense. Wake Forest converted on a third and five earlier in this drive. Here's a third and four. Tech showing blitz. Here they come. Flag is down as Skinner completes it again, this time to Devon Brown downfield. Another late flag comes in. And this was a really late flag from the field judge. I saw a Wake Forest player clapping his hands after overhearing the conversation. Another great throw by Riley Skinner, though. Beating the blitz, had the man press coverage, laid it in perfectly. 
defense, that penalty is reviewed. After the play, dead ball, personal foul, number 56 on Georgia Tech. On behalf of Dixon, first down. Boy, you don't want to get Paul Johnson upset. Osahan Tongo called with the penalty, and Paul Johnson's letting him know that that ain't how we do things around here. Here's the ISO up at the top, actually the middle receiver. You see Griffin going, and he just runs past Rashid, Rashad Reed, excuse me, and that's just perfectly thrown ball to Devon Brown. Devon Brown. That was a 27-yard gain, tack on 12 more for the penalty. 39 yards on the play. First down from the 12. Completed pass and into the end zone for the touchdown. Devon Brown, who just came up with the big 27-yard gain, finishes it off with the score. And you see, there was motion before the snap, and that showed Riley Skinner that it was man-to-man -man coverage, and he knew he had a mismatch with Cedric Griffin on Brown. The outside receiver cleared with his man-to-man -man coverage running into the end zone, and then Brown just runs away from Griffin, an easy throw and catch for the points. Jimmy Newman to tie it up. Devon Brown with a couple of touchdown catches today from Riley Skinner. The first one from 20 yards out. This one from 11. A 74-yard drive culminates with the tying touchdown. Devon Brown had a career-high 12 catches for 101 yards last week in the heartbreaking loss to Miami. He has two touchdown catches today, both of them from this guy, Riley Skinner. Suffered a mild concussion, but he has played quite well. A great answer to Tech's touchdown drive as Wake tied it up at 24. Here's Orwin Smith breaking some tackles, getting out to the 23-yard line with four minutes and 20 seconds left and all three timeouts. Wake Forest, it's been a long time since they have beaten a team in the top 10. In fact, 1946 when they beat Tennessee. 44 straight games. They're in good position right now against the number 10 team in the country, Georgia Tech. And their defense has to find a way to slow and stop this option offense. And not done so very well here in the second half. Save a couple of fourth downs. Georgia Tech up to 412 yards of total offense. Most of it on the ground. Roddy Jones again. This time he breaks a tackle. Here he goes. Breaks another one. And they say he stepped out of bounds way upfield at the 30 line. This crowd is not going to be happy. Well, but clearly he did step on the line, Pam, as he was going around the edge. And there is a flag on the play as well. After the play, Joey Ehrman. Dead ball. Dead ball. Personal foul. Personal foul. Number 40 on the defense. 15 yards from the end of the run. First down. Oh, and that quick pitch has been outstanding to the Yellow Jackets in the second half. And there's the late hit, and there's just no reason for that, Joey Ehrman. You know, that guy was there, and I hit him. And here's the play. Look how wide that pitch gets. You got people out in front. Nice block there from Brad Sellers. But bam, right there you see him. He stepped right on the line. Easy for the official to see. And then a senseless penalty from Joey Ehrman, the true freshman. I think that was Mike Owens over there. Good job seeing him step out at 15 more yards. So that's a 32-yard net gain after the penalty. Let me correct myself. Ehrman's a redshirt freshman. There's Dwyer just pounding it up the middle, and that's... What I believe we're going to continue to see, Pam, they're going to keep the ball on the ground here as they are having a lot of success. I want to welcome everybody in. We've got quite a ball game here. Oklahoma State with a win over Iowa State. Here we have number 10 Georgia Tech tied up with Wake Forest. Where they have been helped by a personal foul penalty to get it down to the 40-yard line. 
And there's a terrific effort by Jonathan Dwyer, well over 100 yards on the day, pushing the pile forward for a first down. And Dwyer getting close to 200 yards. In fact, that's a career high for him on the day. He had 186 last week as a career high. It's two weeks in a row. And you see how he gets it, because not only is he an explosive guy who can get it around the edge with his speed, he can carry some folks for a little bit. That's Ray Bentley. I'm Pam Ward. We join you here in Atlanta. Georgia Tech trying to win its seventh straight football game. Here's a pitch to Anthony Allen. And Allen carries it down to the 30, picks up five more. The best thing Allen did on that was cover the ball with two hands. Critical area and time of the game where you can't afford a fumble, and Allen knows the value of the pigskin. Georgia Tech leading the ACC plus seven in turnover margin. Team that is number one in the ACC, number two in the nation in Russia, has 393 of them so far this afternoon. They average about 304, so they're well above it today. High pitch taken by Jones, taken down in the backfield. Terrific tackle by the cornerback, Brandon G. Finally, Wake is able to stop that quick pitch. And it was pretty much Brandon G fighting off the cut block from Marcus Wright and making a play. Wake Forest calls the timeout. Just over two minutes left to go in a tie ball game. That is Scott Blair earlier in this game. He kicked a 45-yard field goal. That is a career long for him. Right now, if they don't move the ball anymore, it's a 49-yarder. Here's a third and seven for Georgia Tech. And they go backwards. They lose a yard with Jonathan Dwyer. Tristan Doherty coming up to make the stop. So what do you do here, Ray? They like to go for it on fourth down. They've been unsuccessful every time today. What do you think? I think you have to give your guy a shot. When he hit that 45-yarder, he had room to spare. So I think you give him a shot at it. It would be 50 from here. The race to uncover the greatest mystery of mankind has ever faced is on. That is ABC's Flash Forward, all new Thursday at 8, 7 Central, 8 Eastern, 7 Central on ABC. A terrific fall lineup coming your way. So a 50-yarder from here. Georgia Tech 0 for 3 on fourth downs today. This is a fourth and eight. And here's Mr. Blair. Junior from Calhoun, Georgia. Nine for 13 on the season. And I don't see Paul Johnson getting his field goal team ready. He's going to roll the dice on fourth got down and rely on his defense if they don't get it. Yeah, there was Blair. We saw him. He was over on the sideline pretending to kick. And think, he, he's staying on the sideline. I think he has more confidence in, at this point in his offense than he does in his kicker. Do you like this decision? Though? I have to agree with it just because I agree in that it, you have more confidence in the offense than the kicker. All right, here we go. Nesbitt being chased and goes down. Wake Forest has it in good field position at the 41. Just one timeout left to go, but they get it back. You see Nesbitt, he faked that quick pitch, tried to run play action off of it, and then the pressure came in from Hunter Haynes, and Jim Grove says, we're alive, let's go get this one. Paul Johnson, all right, got to play defense. So 0 for 4 on fourth down for the game. Riley Skinner has it at the 41. Zips it out to the sideline, nicely done to Marshall Williams. Steps out of bounds with a minute 45 to go. Picked up eight. Skinner on the last drive, three for three for 51 yards. And he capped it off with the touchdown. An 11-yarder to Devon Brown. Under pressure, goes down, got rid of it. Derek Morgan hit him, and there's the flag. I don't know. He had Kevin Harris in the area. And they're going to call it grounding, but I, I think he was trying to get it to Kevin Harris. 
Now the standard for grounding is you got to be outside the pocket and get it to the line of scrimmage in order to, for there to be no receiver around. But there was Kevin Harris around. And tip for grounding on the offense. That's a loss of down, but start the foul. And third down. Harris is right here, the running back, and he is going to come out and see he's down in the middle. And Skinner sees him at the last second, tries to get the ball to him. I don't necessarily agree with that call. And to make matters worse, the, with the intentional grounding, it's a loss of down, so they're pushed back to third and ten. Georgia Tech runs a stunt up front. And how about cool as can be, Skinner finds Marshall Williams on third and 10 for 21 big yards. We welcome you, welcome those of you who are watching Ohio State and Penn State. We have got ourselves a 24-24 tie. Wake Forest trying to upset number 10, Georgia Tech. Riley Skinner just completing a 21-yard pass on third and 10 to Marshall Williams, his favorite receiver. They have it first down at the 38 of Tech. Skinner, plenty of time. That one should have been caught. And it's incomplete. Boy, Andrew Parker had a chance to catch it. And then it was almost intercepted by Terrence. A perfect throw from Riley Skinner. I mean, it hits him between the eight and the zero. Andrew Parker took his eyes off of that ball. Parker back missed the last couple of games because of a bad ankle. That time it was just bad hands. Improvising, pulls it down, and goes out of bounds with a minute 19 left to go. Morgan Burnett pursued him, but it's a three-yard game for Wake Forest. Jimmy Newman, a true freshman from Oxford, Alabama, is the kicker for Wake Forest. You see our red line there, and that's where the ball has to get, as Jimmy Newman's career long is a 42-yarder, which he hit last week. It would be 52 yards from here. So on third and seven, they need 10 yards to get to his previous career long distance. Skinner goes down. Derek Morgan leads the ACC in sacks, comes up with a huge one on third down. He just steamrolled Mike Renfret. They move Morgan outside to the wide side, and he's just going to come on the blitz. Here he is right here, coming right at Mike Renfret, and watch him just bowl over Renfret. No chance. Get out of the way, son. And then he makes the sack. That is a hack of a ball player, Derek Morgan. Now Wake will face a fourth down, and they'll have to go for it here, I would believe. Unless you want to punt it away and see, you know, Georgia Tech is not known for uh, two-minute passing offense. Then you try and take this thing into overtime. Wake Forest. Wake Forest trying to beat a top 10 team for the first time since 1946. They've lost 42 straight games to teams in the top 10. Georgia Tech just there at number 10. Last week against Miami on the last play of the game, Wake Forest tried a 60-yard field goal. Not going to try it from 57 here tonight. Not going to punt it away. Shane Popham coming in. He's done a good job keeping punts away from Gerard Tarrant, who is the best punt returner in the ACC. And it takes a very good left turn if you're a Wake Forest fan. Josh Bush down there to cover it up, a 37-yard punt, but most importantly, it's killed down at the three-yard line. 
And if there is a criticism for this Georgia Tech offense, it's that when they get in situations like this, it's not their bag to throw the ball around the yard and, and try to, you know, score in the last minute of a ball game. And they'll be put to that test right here. The Georgia Tech with the football back at the three. Now they obviously are known for being a running team, second best in the nation for running the football, but this guy, Demarius Thomas, averages over 24 yards per reception, always a threat, but Nesbitt's gonna hang on to it. Nesbitt on the keeper. It looks like Paul Johnson's gonna just play for overtime at this point. Wake Forest has one overtime game this year. They lost at Boston College. Georgia Tech has not gone in to the extra frame this season. I think this is a good decision by Paul Johnson. They're, not, they're just not built to score in these type of situations. So let's get into overtime, even field, and let's see what we can do. College overtime, unlike the NFL, you do get equal opportunities. You get the football and try to score it, and we indeed are heading to overtime. Paul Johnson's team in the driver's seat now as they try to win the ACC Coastal Division because Duke lost to North Carolina this afternoon. But Tech with a win will stay in front of them in the division, but Wake Forest still has a lot to say about that as we head to overtime. Are your credit cards maxed out? And Wake Forest about to go into overtime. Georgia Tech won the toss. And usually teams that win toss elect to go on defense first. That's exactly what happened. So here are your overtime rules, just to uh, refresh everybody's memory out there. We just saw the coin toss, and Georgia Tech decided to go on defense first. Everybody gets one possession from the opponent's 25-yard line until the winner is decided. Only the play clock is in effect, and once we hit the third overtime, if you score a touchdown, you have to go for a two-point conversion. Wake Forest has struggled in close games this year. Jim Grobe hoping his team can get over that hump. Four which really of their they've five been known losses. For. Yep, four of their five losses, sorry about that, Ray, have been by a grand total of 10 points. Heartbreakers, there you go. Yeah, you see, they lost already one in overtime at Boston College on a field goal where Boston College hit the field goal and then Wake Forest fumbled to end that one. So they'll get the first crack on it on offense. They had that 13-point lead in the fourth quarter last week against Miami and couldn't close them out. Wake Forest with the football first in overtime. Riley Skinner at quarterback. He gives it to Josh Adams. And Adams, who's been pretty, pretty quiet as a runner, is taken down by Mario Edwards, picked up six yards on that first down carry. Good, strong tackle by Edwards. Before that carry, Adams just three carries for 10 yards on the day. Through regulation, Wake Forest with 20 rushing yards compared to 387 for Georgia Tech. It's been the Riley Skinner show all day. Another run play. Adams in big, big trouble. Got away for it from it at least momentarily, but is dropped for a loss by Logan Walls. Yeah, but it was Derek Morgan who makes this play by getting the penetration. You're going to see Morgan, the defensive end. Excuse me, he's on this side right over here. He gets the penetration, just knocks the guard back into the backfield. That's Trey Bailey who got pushed back, and that made the running back Adams have to change direction. Now a critical third down. tackled at the 18 by Morgan Burnett. The Wake Forest 
going to have to try the field goal. Great coverage by the Yellow Jacket defense down the field. Skinner had a lot of time while he was rolling to the edge there, but there was nowhere to throw the football. The Tech defense did its job. Jimmy Newman, who kicked a 35-yarder earlier in this game, lines it up from 34 yards out. He's a true freshman. And he just snuck it inside that right upright. And the freshman was true. And Wake Forest with a 27 to 24 lead over Georgia Tech. Here's a look at that kick again, Pam. And you see it, you said it, snuck it in there just inside the right upright. But at least they get some points out of that deal. And now the defense, which played extremely well on the last drive, will have to do it again. And this is why Georgia Tech elected to go on defense first. They know exactly what they have to do, get a touchdown, and this ball game is over. Josh Nesbitt, the junior captain, running the offense. Jonathan Dwyer, who's run for a career high 187 yards in the backfield, and Nesbitt hangs on to it. Down to the 14-yard line, that's a first down. And Joseph Gilbert, the offensive guard, is going to come around and watch him cut the blocker right there, or the uh, tackler right there, and that's the read that Nesbitt had. He saw the man get knocked off his feet, decided to keep it rather than pitch and move the chains. Georgia Tech now two yards short of 400 rushing on the day. They had 404 against Vanderbilt last week. There's Dwyer, bottled up after a two yard gain, so there's another 400 yard effort for this Georgia Tech team, second only to Nevada in rushing in the nation. I think Tech got away with having two men in motion on that play. Both of the A-backs were moving before the snap. A little confusion there amongst them. The A-backs being those wing backs sitting just behind the offensive tackles. Second and eight in our first overtime. The pitch to Ronnie Jones trying to get outside. What a tackle. Great play by Kyle Quarles, who wouldn't let him get away. Picked up two. This has been Georgia Tech's favorite play in the second half. Just this quick pitch, getting the ball outside quick. Good block on the perimeter, but Quarles does a nice job, and he they have now widened the safeties as Wake Forest just to help get them there for that exact play, and that allowed Quarles to be in position to make the tackle. Brad Lambert, the defensive coordinator for Wake. Here's the third and six. Nesbitt. Pulls it down, puts his head down, and is stopped just short of the first down by Dominique Majette. You have to kick the field goal here. I know Paul Johnson loves to go for it, but and it looks like he is going for it. He's 0 for 4 on fourth downs tonight, and he's still willing to roll the dice. Amazing. Wow, this is only a fourth and one. But it's Wake Forest, it's a very short one. Wake Forest stops him here. They win the game. Wake Forest. And Wake takes its only timeout of the overtime. So you don't, you don't, ice you wouldn't roll the dice here? No. Ice water runs through the veins of Paul Johnson. I tell you, I, I would not hang my season on a fourth and short when I got a chip shot field goal to go ahead and just do it again. You see him 9 for 16 on the year, but 0 for 4 today. But he has a great belief in his offense, and he loves to run the quarterback in these situations. He feels like he can get it 9 out of 10 times, and he's willing to take that chance. Me, not so much. <laughs> If, if he doesn't, if they get it, it's a great decision. If he doesn't, he'll be second guessed for a long time. 
This could be the ball game right here. Nesbitt about 6'1", 215 pounds or so. And we saw him miss a fourth and short earlier on a quarterback sneak where he fumbled the center exchange. See if they try to get him to jump off sides or just go for it. Oh, yeah. Yep, they're just going to try to sucker him, and these Wake Forest guys are too smart for that. That makes more sense to me now. <laughs> so Randy called uh, nothing on infinity play. Uh, so Tech takes the timeout. And now I got to believe we'll be seeing Scott Blair. Blair, the junior from Calhoun, Georgia. Hit a career-long 45-yarder earlier in this game. So, Paul Johnson still having to make a decision. And Morton Ray Bedley joining you from Atlanta, where number 10 Georgia Tech is down to Wake Forest, 27 to 24 in overtime. Jim Grove's team got a field goal by Jimmy Newman to go up by three, and here on fourth and one, he's still going to go for Georgia it. Georgia Tech is indeed going for it. You kick a field goal here, you go to a second overtime. Instead, they're ready to snap it. They're giving him the sneak, though. Nesbitt gets it. And you got to cover both guards and the center, or they're going to get it on the sneak. And Wade did not do that. You got to bring the double eagle down, or bring your linebackers up into a solid, or they're just going to sneak it and they're going to get it. I mean, it's just too big of a gap that you, you can't do it. You got to cover all the three of those guys, or they're going to sneak it and they're going to get it. An all or nothing play for Georgia Tech. What a time to convert their first fourth down of the ball game. So now first and goal from the three. Nesbitt scores. Georgia Tech wins in overtime. Jonathan Dwyer pancakes Kyle Quarles, and Nesbitt followed up right behind him to keep Georgia Tech alive at 9-1. and one. Duke losing to, to North Carolina earlier today. So Tech in first place by themselves in the Coastal Division. Watch the block by Dwyer right there. That's called a pancake. Give me some butter and some syrup. Throw some grits on it since we're in the south. Right there is the block from Dwyer. Clearing the way for Nesbitt. And the gamble on fourth down for the Riverboat Gambler pays off. Just like he knew it would. Always has that face, doesn't he seem to? And then Jim Grobe, another heartbreaking loss. Five losses now by a grand total of 13 points this season. Five of their six losses by 13 points. Two of them coming in overtime. The Ramblin' Wreck ramble for a season-high 412 rushing yards. Going for it on fourth and one in overtime. Instead of kicking the field goal, they went for it. Nesbitt got it on the sneak and then took it in from three yards out for a second rushing touchdown of the game. And Georgia Tech has now won seven straight. They go to nine and one on the season. They're a very good football team, but you take the hat off to Wake Forest because they came out here and they played hard today. What a game. Riley Skinner playing well through the air, but Georgia Tech wins it in overtime 30 to 27. We welcome you back, especially.